<laughs> Good point. Alrighty, should I should I start the slide over then? It's all right. I think we'll just keep, okay. keep going through. Cool. Yeah. So so yeah, plywood plywood is useful. Um, other composites are uh, carbon fiber, um, various different kinds of carbon fibers. Uh, that's uh, similar to fiberglass, except for instead of glass fibers, it's carbon fibers that essentially um, strengthen. Oh, sorry. They the, the fibers strengthen um, some kind of uh, polymer um, that surrounds them. So sort of a combination of a of some kind of epoxy resin type thing and and then this fiber and that fiber could be a, uh, a glass fiber or a carbon fiber um, and there there are other things you can use too but but those are the primary things we use um, and uh, you can buy them um, you can buy tubes uh, made out of carbon fiber and fiberglass um, you can also buy tubes made out of uh, various um, paper products or sort of wood composite products. Um, there's a uh, um, glass, phenolic, and um, blue tube. Blue tube's a material we use a fair amount. It's it's just like really heavy duty cardboard essentially. Um, but but if you're making a rocket um, that isn't too big um, and doesn't need to handle um, huge forces, it, it can be a good material too. Um, and then as far as manufacturing goes, um, or wait a sec, did I miss any? Oh, plastics, yes. Um, we, since we mostly use 3D printing for manipulating plastics, um, we generally stick to uh, plastics that you can 3D print, so thermoplastics. So, so we got PLA, um, that's, that's sort of the, the go-to 3D printable plastic because it's really easy to print but it is relatively brittle and not terribly strong, although it, it, it's not too weak either. Um, then uh, PETG is another um, 3D printable plastic. Um, similar properties, only more flexible and um, uh, lower elastic modulus, but um, I'm kind of getting off into the weeds. Uh, I guess I just mentioned that if you need, you know, a really strong 3D printed part, there are also materials for that. Um, like uh, nylon and polycarbonate. And um, you can put um, various, uh, you can essentially print composites. So you can, you can get filament that has glass fibers or carbon fibers inside it. Um, so, so that you essentially uh, 3D print a, uh, a composite part. So that if, if for whatever reason, if you're designing a rocket and you need a really strong 3D printed part, there are ways to make that happen. Um, as far as manufacturing goes, um, we've got uh, 3D printers like I was just talking about. That's, that's sort of our go-to thing for making uh, intricate parts that, that aren't just, um, they can't just easily be defined by a 2D sketch kind of thing. Like they're not, if you think about SolidWorks, right, you could, you could just fully describe them besides their uh, thickness by just you know, drawing a 2D sketch and then, and then you'd extrude that and that would be it. So, so if, if it's more complicated than that, then, um, then, then we tend to use 3D printers. Um, if it is just a 2D sketch, you know, extruded a certain distance, then, then that's where the, the laser cutter comes in. Uh, so the laser cutter, it's just a laser mounted on this uh, gantry kind of thing. So it essentially just moves the laser cutter back and forth in the X and Y, or sorry, moves the laser back and forth in the X and Y axes. Um, and uh, the laser burns through whatever material you needed to burn through. Um, so th there are only certain materials you can use though, because um, some will light on fire and uh, some will melt and fuse back together again. And th there, there are bad things that can happen, um, but there are some materials that work great, like plywood and acrylic. Um, acrylic works very well, although acrylic's pretty brittle, so you have to be careful with that. Um, then another way um, to uh, make parts that are essentially just, you know, 2D contours extrude, um, the, the water jet cutters. Um, we have a water jet cutter in the lab, and then there's also a water jet cutter in the capstone lab. Um, by the way, we have a laser cutter in the in our lab that we can use. Um, that's that's generally how we get things laser cut. But yeah, for the water jet cutter, um, there is one in the lab, and there's also one in the capstone lab. Um, and uh, 
water jet cutters can water jet cutters are amazing they essentially um shoot hot water um with a, a bunch of this this gritty stuff um it's an it's referred to as abrasive because you know it, it's abrasive um and uh, it uh it just chews through whatever you shoot it at kind of like the laser cutter only it can go through uh steel and aluminum um very thick steel and aluminum actually so i don't know how thick ours can go through but definitely you know quarter to a half an inch i think um maybe maybe even thicker i'm not sure um so yeah that's definitely handy and we've also got in the in the lab we've got the uh Tormach mini, um, well, it's sort of a mill, um, but not not really in the traditional sense. It's 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 a router, but it but the the uh, the spindle can move in the z axis. So it's it's this little thing, kind of like a drill bit um, that spins really fast. On the, it, it's not a drill bit, but it, it spins really fast, and it it looks kind of like a drill bit, and it can move it back and forth in the x and y axes and move it up and down in the z axis. So you put like a, a hunk of fiberglass in there and then it moves the drill bit around to like cut out a bulkhead. A bulkhead's like a, a round chunk that fits inside your rocket. Um, so it'll cut it out. Um, but, but since it can adjust the, the Z height, you can actually get um, uh, something more than just a 2D contour out of it. Um, we don't necessarily use it for that much. Um, because it's very small and weak, um, but uh, but but you, it does have that capability. Whereas the water jet cutter and the laser cutter do not. Um, well, the laser cutter sort of does. You can you can turn down the power on the laser cutter and just take off you know a, a, some of the material, but you can't control that very well. Um, and then as far as mills go, there are um, some uh, bigish mills down in the Capstone Lab um, that can you know, really make um, fancy uh, metal parts. Um, so if you, uh, if you wanted to make really fancy airfoiled aluminum fins, that's how you do that. You'd stick a block of aluminum in it and, and uh, heat it um, and C code or G code. It's this, uh, it's essentially heme readable code that uh, describes the, uh, the path and the speed of the uh, the spindle, that's the, the little drill bit like thingy. Um, so uh, so yeah, um, and then and then after you make this stuff, you have to you have to put it all together. So that's that's where um, assemblies in CAD come in. They they really help you <laughs> figure out how you're gonna fit it all together before you go and make it. When you're designing a rocket, you'll make a lot of like decisions related to that design. And Open Rocket is essentially a software that helps you make those decision des, those decisions in a smart way. Uh, it's a great organizational tool. Uh, so I'm just going to talk through the decisions that you'll have to make for each of these items uh, on the slide. So first up is the size of your rocket, uh, both the diameter and the length uh, of your rocket. You get to choose an Open Rocket, and that kind of defines everything after that. Um, the diameter of the rocket is closely tied to the stability of the rocket and what you're physically trying to fit inside of that rocket. Um, the length is dependent on how many bays, uh, how many parachutes, the number of payloads, um, the length of the motor section. So there are a couple things to consider related to both the diameter and the length. Uh, when you're choosing a motor in open rocket, there is a motor library that is used primarily for flight simulations. Uh, and specifications for each of those motors, like the impulse rating or the impulse you can think of as a measurement of the uh, transmitted moment, momentum from the rocket to um, basically anything else. Uh, the thrust of that motor, uh, so kind of like the average amount of force that that motor produces, and also the size of the motor, the diameter of the motor, and the length of it. So that's kind of where the motor and the length of the rocket come into play. Uh, another kind of decision you have to make is re regarding parachutes, uh, both how many parachutes you'll have in the rocket, and uh, which is basically dependent on how many flight events you have. Uh, so if you have a single deployment versus a dual deployment rocket, uh, you'll 
have to make a decision on the size of each of those parachutes, what makes sense uh, for the specific launch. And you can also define things like the drag coefficient for each of those parachutes. Uh, you'll find that there's a lot of information online about parachutes, uh, both the, like the effective diameter and uh, the drag coefficient. So if you ever have a question about a specific parachute, you can look that up online and uh, find that information. Um, you can also vary the number of fins and the fin geometry of a rocket, an open rocket. Uh, so you can create a more or less a general sketch of what the fin shape will be. Uh, and you can do that right in the open rocket software. Uh, so you can specify the physical size and the shape of the fins that way. And you can also specify the position of those fins along the axis of the rocket. Uh, so all these factors have to do with the center of pressure and the stability of the rocket. Uh, and Andy talked a lot about the um, center of pressure and center of gravity uh, and the stability equation in the first presentation. Um, but it is primarily determined by the design of your fins. Uh, you'll find that the, the center of pressure varies quite a bit if you change like uh, the height of your fin by an inch. It's pretty surprising, but um, that's kind of the primary way that you modify your center of pressure. Um, and you can also do things like adding a cant to your fin or a slight angle to the fin. And what this does is produces uh, spinning of the rocket. And this is usually used for something called spin stabilization, which is something that happens a lot uh, in rocketry. Let's say if you're trying to send a rocket to space, you would have your fins canted so that the flight profile would be as straight as possible. Um, and an example of this is the Go Fast rocket. Uh, you might have heard of it. It is the first civilian launched a rocket that made it into space or a hundred kilometers above sea level. Uh, it's like the, it's called the Kármán line or it's like the, um, it's the unofficial boundary between atmosphere and space. Um, so that was, that was a rocket that had canted fins. And um, if you go online and look that video up, it's pretty cool. It, it's kind of incredible how fast that thing actually spins. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, another thing that you can vary is the nose cone weight. Uh, generally, you'll find that uh, the task becomes moving the center of gravity forward to increase the rocket stability to a value of at least two. Um, that's just in general. There are exceptions to that for sure, but uh, m many of the designs that I've seen, that's, that's kind of the goal is to um, move the center of gravity forward somehow and uh, varying your nose cone weight is a great way to do that. Um, and uh, the last kind of thing is related to surface finish of your rocket and the paint job. Uh, so you can see within Open Rocket, you'll have kind of a, um, a drop down where you can specify the component finish. And I personally don't know how much painting a rocket has, or how large an effect painting a rocket has on its like maximum altitude, but that's something we'll find out tonight together, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that, you know, painting your rocket, obviously it, it changes the amount of, of drag your rocket would experience, but it also adds weight to the rocket. Uh, so there's kind of a trade-off between uh, to paint your rocket. And most of the time we do like to paint our rockets because, uh, you know, if it doesn't look good on the pad, it just... <laughs> There's, there's really no point. You know, why are we building the rock in the first place if it doesn't look good? <laughs> but um, yeah, those are kind of some of the decisions that you'll have to make within Open Rocket and in rocket design and in, um, in general. Before we get into actually modeling, there's a couple of like really important parts that are specific to rocket that we want to talk to you guys about. So the first of those are bulkheads and centering rings. And those are interior components of your rocket. So your rocket is a tube and all the bulkhead and center rings go inside of that. Um, so we've got a couple pictures here to sort of illustrate what that is. Um, centering rings are to hold your motor tube in place. So the motor is a smaller diameter than the rocket body, almost always. Um, and so you need a way to hold that tube in the center of your rocket tube and the way you do that is centering rings. Um, and it's literally just, you know, a disc with another hole cut in the middle of it. It's like a donut shape, basically. Thank you. Good. Good arrow. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, in this, this picture, the motor tube is red, and then there's no body tube here, so you can actually see what's going on, but the body tube would slide over that whole thing. Um, and you can make the centering rings also hold the fins in place. That's how this one works. Um, you can see that the fins are sort of stuck into other slots in the centering ring, so that holds everything together. Um, so those are really important because if your motor's not centered, then it's going to do funky things to your thrust and your rocket's going to go sideways, which is bad. Um, the other one is bulkheads, and bulkheads are literally just discs that go in your rocket and they separate sections. Um, so if you remember way back to the first meeting, um, I talked about parachutes and like how, you're, how to recover your rocket safely, right? And so the way you do that is you have a parachute bay, which has a parachute in it, and then when you want to recover your rocket, you shoot the parachute out. Um, and you do that by pressurizing the parachute bay most of the time. In order to make sure your parachute bay pressurizes, it needs to be a sealed section. It can't just be open to the rest of the rocket and the air and whatever else. Um, so you need bulkheads at the end to hold, to like make it a sealed section. You need bulkheads to sort of support other parts of the rocket too, like the motor um, and payload bays and so forth. So you can, you can epoxy those in, you can screw those in, both them with nuts, depends on the design of your rocket. Um, but in the picture on the right here, you can see that sort of loop in the middle there is a place to attach your shock cords. That's where you attach the parachute to. Um, and then the little cups around the edge are blast caps. So that's where you put your black powder um, for the ejection tar charge to actually open the rocket. Again, good arrows. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Um, and then the other thing on this bulkhead is a mechanical parachute release system. So you can put all sorts of other systems. You generally use bulkheads to mount them in your rocket as well. Looks good. Uh, yeah, so Becky touched a bit upon the importance of fins in making a rocket that's stable. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail on this. Uh, in our first meeting, we talked briefly about the physics of rockets and what the center of pressure is. But just I'm going to briefly reiterate it, and I'm also going to send you guys a link really quick. Um, so this link that I have right here is basically, it's, it's a really nicely outlined and brief like document that explains what fins are doing and why they help your rocket stay stable. And I think this is, this is probably one of the most like intuitive and succinct explanations I've heard. So if you're at all interested in that, feel free to dive deeper with that website right there. Um, but getting back into it, first I'm going to explain how fins are dimensioned. Um, so in the top right, you can see a quick diagram. Uh, that's how Open Rocket understands fins. So these exact labels that you'll see here for the dimensions is exactly what Open Rocket's going to see when you go to type in what your dimensions are for your fins. Um, so like Becky was saying, your fins are important because they allow you to drag your center of pressure further back. So think of it like the more wind that your fins are catching, the further back the center of pressure will be. And the main goal here is to get your center of pressure below your center of gravity so that it keeps the rocket stable. So basically you'll adjust your fins to make it so that that center of pressure is where you want it. Um, so fins are, fin shape in our case is actually not that important. Like the, the fin shape itself, whether that's going to be like a triangle or a trapezoid, it doesn't make a huge difference. What really matters for your fin is mostly the height. That's going to be your biggest impactful factor. So you can actually kind of have some fun with your fin shape. You can make it elliptical. You can make it just like a, a single um, triangle. You can make it a trapezoid. And that won't have a huge impact. But your height and how much area it goes out, that will make a huge impact on how much drag you're creating. Um, Becky also mentioned what tabs are. So a tab is basically a little protrusion that um, comes out of your fin and actually slits into the rocket itself. So typically when it comes to mounting fins, we will use a tab system. Um, or we'll use similarly to the, um, the setup that was shown in the past slide, you'll have two um, centering rings and you'll have little metal points to attach your metal tabs to. So that's for the bigger rockets, but in our case, we'll just be using tabs. Um, there's a quick rule of thumb for how thick you want or how what the height of your tab should be. It's quickly just the, the body outer diameter minus the motor tube outer diameter. So that's a nice rule of thumb for your small scale rockets. Um, and yeah, we'll be able to model these things really easily in Open Rocket. That's why it's great. It lets you, there's even a feature in Open Rocket to optimize different parts of the rocket for you. Um, so you can play around with that once we get into more detail. And just for fun, really quickly, um, in the bottom right, you can see like 
what aerofoiling a fin looks like. In our case, we're not even worried about that because we're not in that sort of scale yet. But when you get to certain speeds, uh, especially once you get into supersonic, the aerofoiling of your fins actually has a big impact. So interestingly enough, you can see subsonic, supersonic, and unsymmetric designs here. Um, just a fun thought. The reason why they do the unsymmetric uh, design here is actually to induce a rotation in your rocket. So if your rocket's rotating, basically it's, it's much more stable because it doesn't want to uh, tip off of its current rotational trajectory. There's like a whole bunch of math behind that, which actually is outlined in that, um, that website if you're all interested, but it's a cool little tidbit. And now that we know what the important design decisions are and what our fins should be designed around, uh, we're gonna dive into really quickly showing you what Open Rocket actually looks like. So uh, Andy, if you wanna stop sharing, I'll actually hop onto the share. I'll start with a blank template actually. So this is what Open Rocket will look like when you first hop in. Um, the beauty of Open Rocket is that it just lets you really quickly assemble a rocket. Like it's it's super streamlined. So we'll go down tip to tail in terms of designing our rocket. So up here is all the different buttons that you have to insert different components of your rocket. So first thing we're going to want is a nose cone. So I'll click the nose cone button, and then it basically allows me to type in all the different parameters that I want. Um, and mine's I have my default setting set to Imperial, so it'll show up as inches. Uh, you can change your cone shape. Right now it's Oga. You can change it to an ellipsoid. You could change it to conical. Um, and just fun with this kind of thing. Um, typically you you can use this tool to figure out how it's going to impact your rocket, and then you'll buy based on what your final designs look like. So we'll insert this arbitrary nose cone, and now we'll just add a body tube after it. And same thing, it matches up automatically with the OD on each of these parts. And then, so Open Rocket also allows you to create multiple stages of your rocket. So if we click and hit new stage, we can add a transition now. And let's say we want the aft diameter to get really big. We want our rocket to be thick on the bottom. We can adjust all of that here. And then again, I'm like, all right, I want to add more tubing. I'll hit tube. And it's that simple. Rocket, it lets you just stitch things together really. Early. Um, when you want to actually add your motor in, you'll quickly create an inner tube. And then this is basically the inner tube that your motor will actually be mounted in. So um, you'll have an idea of what that diameter should be. Uh, we have it written down in your instructor on. So you'll set that inner and outer diameter to match whatever your actual setup is. And then, yeah, you can add fins from here too. So if I want to add a part to say this tube right here, I'll just click on this part in particular and I'll say, let's add trapezoidal fins and then it'll stitch them together. And so here you can see those dimensions that I had in that diagram really quickly. You have your height, your tip cord, cord all that. Stuff. So as we modify the height, it will adjust in a corresponding manner. And so here is the beauty of Open Rocket. We have these two circles on the center of our design now that it's technically a complete rocket. Um, this right here is your center of gravity. So, and then this right here is center of pressure. So naturally your center of gravity is not really impacted by the size of your fins. It's like, it's a nominal change in the mass, but your center of pressure will be. So you can notice as I increase the height, that center of pressure creeps further and further back because it's creating more and more drag. So this is what allows us to really quickly balance our rockets and make things that are stable. Um, in the top right here, you'll see your cal, which is basically uh, an equation for how stable your rocket is. And we usually try to get our rockets to around two cal. That's like our standard. So in this case, this rocket's not really that stable yet. I'd have to do a lot more designing to fix that up. And then I'll show you a completely designed rocket really quickly. This is what Project Redshift is currently using as our working model. Um, and so um, once you have a, a rocket like this that's designed, as you can see, we've got around 2.1 cal, which is ideal. Um, you can actually um, you go ahead and do some simulations with it. So actually, sorry, one thing I wanna tell you before we go into simulations is um, to change this center of gravity and to make it more accurate, you can add mass components to different parts of your rocket. So let's say, for example, I'm, I know that I'm gonna have a payload in this upper tube. I can just create a mass component and I can say, let's just put like, I don't know, two pounds here. And then this center of gravity will change accordingly. And you can change the location of that, um, that, that mass component, basically just by dragging it around, changing the length of it, 
things like that. So it's a very easy to play with system. And if you have any questions, we'll go through that together later. So once you've simulated your actual mass components in the shape of your rocket, you can do some really cool stuff with figuring out how your rocket's gonna perform. So in the top left up here, this is where you plug in your motor and you'll tell the open rocket system what motor you're gonna be running. Uh, in this case, we told it that the motor is gonna be going into this thing called the motor tube, which is this piece right here. And we told it, we're gonna select our motor. We want this, this motor right here. This has just been the one that we're currently working with. Um, you, this is a list of all the different rockets, motors that are generally commercially available. And they have all kinds of different total impulses, um, different diameters and lengths. And these are actually, you can see the scale of rockets, engines that we were talking about earlier. It's the alphabet scale that we mentioned before with every letter being a doubling of the impulse. So again, we're gonna pick the K rocket here, the rocket motor here. And then what that allows us to do is to go to flight simulations. So here you can create a new simulation and you can give it parameters like an average wind speed, um, standard deviation, turbulence, and you can simulate how your rocket will actually perform when launched. So in this case, we've already created a simulation that's pretty close to uh, what we expected for this rocket. So once we have all of our parameters laid out, we can hit run simulations, screen, it's happy. And this is all the basically produced results from this rocket. So we know that the apogee is around 4,300 feet. We know what our um, our max velocity is. It's 571 feet per second. And we know how long it takes us to get to apogee, all that stuff. And you can even plot this by hitting plot export. And then we want all of our parameters. So we'll just go ahead and hit plot right after this. And you can see a really nice, easy to read graph of your rocket's flight time. Um, and this is pretty intuitive um, because you can see your altitude, your velocity, and your acceleration. So in this case, the acceleration naturally is highest when the rocket engine first goes off. So when your velocity is also gonna be sharply accelerating the most. And then as you teeter off in velocity, eventually, once you get to the bottom here, that's when you're gonna get to your apogee. And again, it's gonna slowly fall with its, its strobe parachute. And then you'll have a second deployment time here where the second shoot will go off. So naturally we have another acceleration and then it'll continue to fall gently to the ground. So that's a more detailed just, overview. Oh, go ahead. Just yeah. a note about that second acceleration when the parachute comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, Open Rocket simulates the rocket's descent using a drag coefficient, which is like CD, that's what its variable name is, C sub D. Um, and what the reason why this acceleration is so sharp, and you won't see this actually being the case in real world, is because in open rocket calculations, it's an instantaneous change in drag coefficient. Uh, whereas when you have an actual parachute deployment, you have like your sections separating, and the parachute comes out and starts to like fill up with air, and then is the full size uh, and uh, parachute. So you're, you, you'll have more of a transition. Um, so your deceleration will take longer. Um, so that's something to take into account. You can't just you know, land right away after your parachute deploys. Um, and B, your acceleration will be significantly less than what it is. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't be cautious of the <laughs> deceleration caused by your parachute deployment, because it has been the case where um, cords snap, uh, like shock cord snaps, or uh, it just yanks through the body tube and causes zippering, or yanks a, a component right out of the bay uh, if it's not screwed in uh, appropriately. So just a side note. So as far as motors go, I'm going to delete this configuration. Um, so we got this configuration right here. That's that's for this motor here. Um, see, that's that's one thing actually we should talk about. So um, you might not be sure what motor you're going to use, right? So if you want to test different motors, um, you can add extra configurations. Um, so you can go to the new configuration, and then you can tell it what motor you want to use for that configuration. Um, 
and then uh, and then you can um, when you go to simulate you can select uh, which sorry uh, this doesn't seem to be working yet you can select which configuration you want to use um, but I'm just going to use this configuration I've got here this configuration um, I don't know probably most of you guys have are, got to this but um, uh, if you if you go in here uh, you can't click on this you click over here double click over here and it'll allow you to select a motor um, and then it'll give you information about the motor it'll give you uh, the thrust versus time curve um, and as I was uh, telling some of you guys um, you know the area under this curve is the the impulse which is the change in momentum which is the change of the value of mass times velocity so you know, of course, the mass of the rocket does change, but you can think of it as sort of um, for a given mass, how, how much the, uh, the motor can cause the, uh, the rocket to change its velocity. Um, and uh, so it's, it's measured in Newton seconds, which uh, Newton seconds are equivalent to a kilogram meter per second. So that's, you know, units of momentum, uh, mass times velocity, kilograms times meters per second. Um, so that's, that's sort of what's going on here. Um, and you can see the max thrust is up here, fairly close to the beginning, and then um, it tails off and then dies. Um, so we got max thrust is 235 newtons for this um, I motor and uh, average of 169 newtons. Um, and uh, the, the, the impulse is what determines um, whether, you know, like what letter class it, it belongs to. Um, so you can see here, I class is between um, 330 newton seconds and 640 40 newton seconds. Um, so this is, you know, 24% of the way through that range, essentially. That's, that's what this is saying. We will go over to uh, recovery here. This is before you simulate, um, you've got to get this working. So I don't know how many parachutes you guys all put in your rocket, um, but if you just put one, you're probably going to want to have it deploy. Uh, pretty soon after Apogee, um, you probably just set it to Apogee. Um, See so if you double click on, you know, the, the name of the parachute here for, for the configuration you want to simulate, um, you can uh, tell it when you want it to deploy. Um, now, if you're, if you're using a, uh, a charge, um, uh, like a, a delay grain, essentially, so it's, it's like a charge that's, that's part of the motor itself, um, then, then that's going to be uh, time dependent. Um, so, so you go from launch a certain number of seconds. But if you got electronics in there, um, like an, an altimeter is what I mean. Um, if you've got an altimeter in there to figure out uh, how high you are, um, and then um, based on that, fire the charges, then, then you'd probably do it based on um, either apogee or um, a specific altitude during descent. Um, so, so in the case of this rocket, uh, for the drogue chute, I've got that set to Apogee because I want the drogue chute to open at Apogee. So it immediately starts slowing the rocket down a bit um, once it's got to uh, the highest point it's going to get to on its trajectory. Um, so Apogee plus zero seconds. Um, and then for the main parachute, um, that's, that's the, the bigger parachute that can, comes out later to make it so that it doesn't um, hit the ground at a at an unsafe uh, velocity, um, I uh, I have that set to a specific altitude during descent, um, and that altitude is uh, 200 meters. So that's you know 656 feet or something like that, um, which is a fairly good altitude. You could go a little lower than that actually, but but this is fairly standard. Um, because that, that gives it time to get open before you hit the ground. Um, but it, it's not so high that uh, the rocket stays in the air forever and therefore drifts all over eternity um, because of the wind. Because um, the, the way it works is that the parachute doesn't actually make the rocket go faster with the wind. I mean, the parachute, you know, the, the, the rocket as it's falling is pretty much going to go the same speed as the air is going relative to the ground. Um, like, uh, so, so it'll go about the speed of the wind. It's just that if it stays up for longer, it'll 
have a longer time to, to go at that speed. So for, you know, rate times time, um, you're going to have a, a greater time and therefore a greater distance. Um, so, so that's sort of what, what, what you're trying, you're trying to minimize time. So, so you want to set this altitude low enough so that it doesn't have that much time, but high enough so that it has time enough to get the parachute out so that it doesn't hit the ground at, you know, 50 feet per second or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, there's, uh, so the, those are, those are sort of the settings we need to set before we simulate. Um, then we go over here to a uh, simulation. Um, if you haven't already, you can click new simulation. Um, so then we've got the simulation here and, uh, um, you want to set the, uh, the launch rail length to something, um, reasonable. These rockets are fairly small rockets. I don't know. What, what do you guys think for a, would, would likely be the launch rail length for these things? Um, I mean, I mean longer is better, uh, essentially, usually, but, uh, what were you thinking? Like a meter? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, so here, we'll, we'll call it a meter. Um, and, uh, then, um, uh, th this is a good option to have selected. You're going to be launching um, upwind, most likely. If, if you're going to tilt the, the launch rail at all, you're going to tilt it into the wind. Um, so, so let's say we, we tilt it just a tad into the wind. Um, uh, and uh, that will um, make it a little bit more stable off the, off the launch rail. Um, then, then you need to set the average wind speed. Um, you can you can change the units on that. So if you want um, miles per hour, because you know that's what the weather forecast tells you, then uh, you can go for that. Um, let's say uh, we'll put a, a ten mile per hour wind on here. Um, so if you, if you think about it, if you've got a higher wind, it'll cause the uh, the rocket to pivot into the wind more because um, the the velocity of the wind is is higher. Um, compared to the ro velocity of the rocket, so it it makes the the, the relative airspeed you know point into the wind more than it than it would if if the the velocity of the wind were lower. Um, so uh, so the, essentially, the the higher the wind, the more the rocket pivots into the wind, which means that the lower it goes, right? Because it 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 gets off going like this. So obviously, it's it's not going to get up as high. Um, so, so higher wind days, your rocket's not going to go as high. Um, it's all also going to, you know, go off to the side more. Um, but then, um, it will drift back the other way once you have the parachutes out. Um, standard deviation. So that's how much the wind fluctuates. Um, so we'll leave it at this, um, turbulence intensity. We, we can leave that at the, the default too. Um, and wind direction is kind of irrelevant. We're not, um, worrying about a specific location. You can um, if you want to and you can, you know, specify temperature and pressure and stuff like that. Um, but, but we won't do that um, right now. Um, so then we go to uh, simulate and plot. Um, and uh, this is where we get to, so it, it essentially already run the simulation, but this is where we get to decide what we want to show up on our graph. Um, so we probably want altitude. That's a good thing to know. Um, our x-axis will be time. That's that's you know, uh, th that's what you're going to want. Um, and uh, there are a few other things that we might want on here, though. Like uh, actually, yeah, total velocity is kind of cool. Although that's going to make the that's going to make the graph too busy. Um, let's go for uh, uh, total acceleration. How about that's oh never mind. We already have vertical acceleration. How about laterally, lateral um, distance? That's actually useful. That, that'll tell you how much the rockets drifted um, away from the launch site. Because that's when you're, you know, messing with your rocket and open rocket, you're going to want to um, mess with it and try to get the, the, dri uh, the, uh, the drift distance uh, down as far as possible, because that means you're less likely to lose the rocket. Um, and... Uh, we can we can adjust the units too, um, so if we want you know the altitude in feet, we can have it in feet. Um, and this is where we select um, what points on the graph we want to have marked. Um, so you know motor burnout and um, 
we don't really need motor ignition. Um, launch rail clearance, we could have that. Uh, that's sort of useful, um, although it'll be really low. Uh, ground hit, um, apogee. Uh, the, yeah, so, so we'll, we'll leave that uh, there. Um, so yeah, I think this is this is a good starting point. So we'll, we'll hit plot now, um, and here's our plot. So you can see here. Uh, so you can uh, you can click and drag to select a portion of the graph you want to see bigger. So you can see here. This is uh, this is essentially that that thrust versus time curve that we saw um, earlier. So this is it's not um it's it's not the same curve obviously. It's it's um, vertical acceleration versus time. So it's it's leaving out the uh, the mass, right? It's it's instead of mass times acceleration versus time, it's just acceleration versus time. But you can see how it's it's essentially the same shape as that curve we saw earlier. So that's that's motor specific. That just depends on um, how the explosives are arranged, and uh, so and that that regulates how how fast they burn, and and that regulates what this curve looks like. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. Um, then you can see, actually here, I should zoom in here again. You can see that max velocity occurs about the time that the motor burns out. So that's, that's of significance um, uh, for, for some things, although we don't need to go into that, I guess. Um, and uh, then uh, you can see that uh, after, after motor burnout, um, Right, right around here. That's that's this line here. See, it says motor burnout. Then the uh, the velocity tapers um, pretty fast because of the drag on the rocket. Um, but you know, it's it still got plenty of velocity, so it keeps um, heading up. Um, and then, right when velocity crosses the zero line, is uh, when it's reached apogee. Um, that's uh, pretty obvious, I guess. Um, and then um, as far as lateral distance goes, you can see that the max lateral distance um, at this point in the graph is, is right around apogee. Because as it's going up, it heads into the wind. So the, so the wind's coming from this way. It heads it up into the wind um, until it reaches apogee, at which point it deploys a parachute. And then the wind you know, catches the parachute and, and the rest of the rocket. And um, the rocket's no longer at all streamlined, so it can't it can't just sort of keep going into the wind. The, the wind's really going to catch it and um, pretty quickly accelerate it to the, the velocity of the wind. So then the parachute and the rocket are going to go drifting off in the direction of the wind. So, so that's why, you know, essentially the rocket goes up into the wind and then it comes back this way. And that, that's what we're seeing here. So it, it goes up into the wind and then it drifts back and then since this is an absolute value scale, um, it, it actually crosses the axis here and, and keeps going. Um, so it ends up, you know, on the other side of the launch rail from, from the direction it went to begin with. So it goes up, so if it starts here, it goes up here and then it comes back, you know, and ends up over here is what we're seeing. Um, and you can see here, if you put multiple parachutes on there, um, you've got one, terminal velocity. So you've got one descent rate for the first part of descent because the drogue parachute deploys here and keeps the, the descent rate at sort of a steady, pretty fast speed until you get to that 200 meters. Um, and then the main parachute comes out and, it, um, and then it uh, levels out a bit more and the, the slope decreases. Um, and then it uh, lands with a uh, vertical velocity of, let's see, what is it? It's, uh, you know, about uh, negative six uh, meters per second. Um, uh, so, so that's actually a, a very safe velocity. So that's, that's pretty good. That's what you'd want. Um, and then as far as, uh, actually, I, you know, I've probably sped it off enough for now. Um, so, uh, so are there any questions on that? 